Welcome, everybody. It's always exciting to have a chance to talk about chickens. I love it. And uh, I'm really delighted that we have such a good turnout tonight. Uh, you know, because we have so many people, you guys are muted. So uh, as Allison said, if you have questions, you can put those in the chat and we'll see if we have time to get to them. Uh, I have a slideshow that we're going to go through and uh, kind of see things from my perspective. But I do want to say this. Uh, I am not a veterinarian. I'm not a certified master chicken keeper, if there is such a thing. Uh, I'm just a guy who loves chickens. And I've learned a lot. And uh, as Allison said, I've uh, been keeping chickens actually for more than 20 years, almost 25 with a little break in there at one point. And so I've learned quite a lot and I've got a lot of experience. And I'm also one of those people who loves to collect books and resources and read about what everybody else thinks. So in that way, I have a lot of uh, experience, but I will guarantee you that something, at least, hopefully not too much, but at least one or two little things I might say tonight, you will be looking around at other chicken resources and books or websites, and you will see a contradictory opinion. And you'll say, hey, what did that guy on the Zoom say that, that I should do ABC, and now I'm reading the book and it says I should do XYZ. And that is simply the fact with any kind of learning process, but especially one like this, where we're very close to the process and we're, you know, finding our own way of how to do it, is that everybody has their own view. So I don't want you to take anything I say as absolute gospel. The best thing for you to do is to get started and start learning. And so really my, my little speech before we get into the content is don't be overwhelmed by the idea that you have to know everything, right? Chickens are very forgiving animals. And yeah, you could screw up and kill them if you really did it badly. But hopefully with the basic information that we're giving you and the resources, that won't happen. And then maybe you'll learn a thing or two and you'll think, well, I'd slightly do it this, this way, maybe a little differently next time. But don't be overwhelmed. Just, just get started. You know, it's so fun, so rewarding. And it's really a wonderful thing for anyone to do who has the ability to do it. So with all of that preaching out of the way, I will share my screen. Let's see if I can pick the right screen to share. That would be this one. Let me also warn you that I have a very creaky chair. So if you hear it's something that sounds like the haunted house at Disneyland, that's just my chair. Okay, we're not going to start on the second slide. There we go. So here's our first question. And that is, why? Why should we bother? Can't you just go down to the grocery store and buy a dozen eggs for crying out loud? And you certainly can. <clears throat> And you can even go to the farmer's market and get to know the egg vendor there, which actually is a great thing to do if you're not going to keep chickens, rather than buying them at the grocery store, where you know almost nothing except what they say in the breathless prose on the carton. Some of those cartons have a novel on them about how wonderful everything is for the chickens, but you don't know if that's true. 99% of the text on those chicken, uh, those egg cartons is not regulated language. So they can say it, but they don't have to back it up. There are a couple of terms that they do have to, or you know, certified organic being the most obvious, and a couple of other things that they do have to actually prove. But mo for the most part, things like uh, you know, natural and cage free, and things like that, not regulated terms. So if you can go to the farmer's market, and get to know somebody and ask them, how do you raise your hens? What kind of conditions are they in? How many do you have? Where do you live? That's great. So, however, if you don't want to do that and you're thinking of having your own hens, why would you go to that effort to have chickens? So the first thing is that the eggs will be the freshest eggs you've ever had. And it is truly a treat. It's truly remarkable to crack that egg into the pan and to see that yolk sitting up so fresh, so firm, not running all over the place. And most of the time, a very beautiful orange color 
because the hens are getting a wonderful diet, mixed diet of all kinds of things, including a lot of green leafies, a lot of plants containing chlorophyll, which is what gives them the orange color of the yolk. No, it's not green eggs and ham, even though they, <laughs> even though the green food is what gives the, the color to the yolk, it's orange. So really it's a, it's a delight to have that, the fresh eggs and the nutrition. And a lot of the good things that you feed your hens can come through in their eggs. Uh, now, if you want to consider chickens for meat, that is another process. We'll talk a minute or two about that on a couple of slides further on. Um, but this really is Backyard Chickens 101, and that is Backyard Chickens 201 if we're getting into raising meat chickens. Um, it's a perfectly doable thing, but it has definitely a higher level of complexity. But you can think about it, and there's lots of ways to learn more uh, if you want to also have the meat of the chickens. And, you know, there's sort of two categories there. If you raise them that are breeds designed to produce meat, they grow very fast, and you butcher them within three months, literally, maybe four. You don't want them to be very old. And that's a real production operation where you're keeping track of the age and you're replacing the hens frequently. And then there's the old hen or the old rooster, which some people do uh, use the meat of their old laying hens. And we'll, we'll talk about that, how long do they last and that kind of age question in a minute. But if you're just keeping them to have a few old hens to make chicken soup out of, that's kind of a different process from raising the broilers, from raising the fast growing meat hens, or they don't have to be hens actually. And I did, uh, one time I did taste an old, uh, I think it was an old rooster that somebody had butchered and they cooked it in the way you would a grocery store chicken. They just kind of roasted it. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> you might as well just cut a piece off your shoe and save money. You know, they're, they're just, <laughs> There really isn't any point in eating an old chicken like that in any other way than to boil it and boil it and boil it. And when you do that, when you boil it for three or four hours, then the meat is in fact tenderized until it's not so totally leathery and impossible to chew. And it's, it's still a little bit, it's not falling apart tender, but it's certainly edible. But the broth that you produce, from boiling that hen for so long. Oh my goodness. And that's, you know, the classic chicken soup. If you're sick, that's really what it is, is those old hens and roosters that were cooked for so long. So anyway, that's, that's another bonus if you are thinking about something besides eggs, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the process for that tonight. But help in the garden is wonderful because what chickens are producing is the best animal manure there is. Right, chicken manure has the highest nitrogen. I mean, the truth is any bird manure has the highest nitrogen content of any animal manure. And uh, not to gross anybody out, but that's because it all comes out of the same opening, right? So with birds, there are not two different, there's not a urine and a feces opening. It's all mixed together. And so the high nitrogen that's in the urine is also accompanying that chicken manure as it comes out. So how do you use that in the garden? Well, we'll talk about that in a little while, but basically you have access to this fabulous resource for either your compost pile or your garden. I'm not advocating you put it directly on the garden. Uh, I'll mention that in a second, but it's there. And now do they help in the garden in other ways? Yes and no. They can actually scratch around and, and uh, eat weeds. They, they're very good at eating weeds if they are, are controlled. And we'll talk about chicken tractors as a way to do that, or, or movable pens, but they also eat everything else. So if you're letting them just run loose in your yard, they're not going to consume vast quantities of leaves and ignore your vegetables and flowers. They will eat the vegetables and flowers too. So help in the garden with some control is really what I should say there, but they definitely can help in the garden. And even if you never let them out, into your main garden, you've got that manure, which is such a great resource. The other thing that we're all trying to do these days, and as we move into an uncertain future, hopefully a low carbon future, uh, is just be more sustainable and self-sufficient. And so if you're 
raising your own hens that produce eggs and possibly meat, uh, you are a more sufficient, self-sufficient uh, food producer and you're a locavore, you know where your food is coming from. And of course, they're just a lot of fun. It's just a great pleasure to just watch them. They're very entertaining. They do all kinds of silly things and scratch around and chase each other and they have the pecking order. That's a real thing. There really is a social order in every flock of chickens. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. It's really wonderful. And as you can see from the picture here, it's also your patriotic duty. I don't know if you can, can you see my cursor? Maybe you can see I'm saying in time of peace, a profitable recreation. In time of war, a patriotic duty. Now we're not at war and hopefully we never will be, but it's still something Uncle Sam wants you to do. All right, enough of that. So the question that often comes up right away, after, actually the first question is, do I have enough space to do this at all? And where would I put the darn coop or chicken yard? And we'll talk about that. But then the next question is, is it even legal to do it where I live? And of course the question literally is different for every single jurisdiction. So this is gonna be up to you to do some research. Uh, I have a document that uh, Allison can share with you or uh, Sustainable Solano folks can share with you. Um, they'll email it to you afterwards along with the document that is the PDF version of this slideshow. And it shows you some links to a couple of different cities in my area, Central Contra Costa County, what their municipal code says about having chickens. And the first thing to know is that municipal codes are written by lawyers, so don't expect to understand what the heck they're talking about until you've read it over about three times. You know, they use words like poultry and fowl. Uh, but secondly, the answer to is it legal is all over the map. Um, I don't know of any jurisdictions that have absolutely no zoning types that allow chickens, but many jurisdictions, cities or counties, only allow them in certain zoning areas. So you need to know what kind of zone your property is, right? Is it R20, is it R10, is it R40? There are different types of zones and those have to do with the size of the lots. So you can find that out first and there's maps and there's easy ways to look up your property and find that out. And then you look at the municipal code and you see what it says. And so some cities will say very specifically, you can have up to four hens and no roosters. Other cities or counties will say, you can have some chickens if you want but you have to get a permit to do it. And you have to send the permit in and tell us how many chickens you're gonna have. Other municipal codes will say uh, something about chickens or not, and then they will tell you about the coop. Any building that houses livestock has to be no more than 100 feet from the street, no more than 50 feet from the nearest property line, all kinds of things like that. And it is a good idea to understand these rules. I will say this, however, and hopefully I'm not gonna get in trouble since this is being recorded. I would guess that 75% of the chicken owners in this area, at least, and probably the whole country, do not know what the rule is for their city. They're just like, well, that guy over there has chickens, I'm gonna try it. And they didn't bother to do the research. And there is no vehicle that drives up and down the street peering into your backyard to see whether or not you have chickens. So how does anybody get busted? Well, the, most often, either when the house is sold and an inspector comes and says, uh, you know, your chicken coop's too close to the property line, you can't uh, sell the property until you fix that. Or if you have a neighbor who's annoyed because of smell, and we'll talk about that, or uh, roosters, if you have a rooster, or any some other issue, and they actually, rather than talk to you, they call the city and say, my neighbor has chickens and I don't think they should. Then somebody might come out and actually look and see whether you're meeting the code. So I am not advocating breaking any laws. I am just saying, talk to your neighbors, understand the general situation in your area, yeah, look at the code, but really 
the key is to keep your neighbors happy. And if you're giving them some fresh eggs, they're generally happy. Uh, now that, of course, gets to how many chickens do you need to have? Maybe you only want to have enough to keep your family supplied instead of the whole neighborhood. But that's the situation. So I do recommend you look at the, at the codes and you will see some examples of that in the resource sheet that I'm going to send. All right, so here's a quick uh, rundown on this question of meat chickens or not. Uh, and as I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because that would be a different workshop and it's, it's good stuff to know. So if you're interested, keep doing your research. But uh, the first thing to realize is that chickens have been domesticated for thousands of years. I would say they may be one of the very earliest domesticated animals, perhaps right after dogs and horses. And because they're ground nesting birds, that means they lay their eggs on the ground, not ground roosting. Roosting is where they sleep at night. And they like to get up off the ground to sleep at night. But nesting, they lay their eggs on the ground. I think our early ancestors thought that was pretty cool because you can just kind of push your way through the bushes and there's a nest of eggs that you can eat instead of having to climb a tree. And so that may be one of the reasons that chickens ended up being domesticated versus other birds. And we have ground, uh, ground birds in our area, the two most famous probably, one native and one non-native, are the California quail, native, and the uh, turkey, the wild turkey, which is not native. But in both cases, they spend their whole day on the ground and they just go up in the trees to roost at night or to get away briefly, get away from uh, predators. So these animals have been domesticated for so long that all these different breeds have been developed the same way we've done with all the other domesticated animals horses, cows, sheep, dogs, cats. And so there are breeds of chicken that are specifically raised just to lay eggs. There are breeds called all-purpose breeds that are specifically bred to be pretty good layers, but also be good meat chickens, if you choose to do it that way. And then there are breeds that are just for meat. Uh, now, the fun thing, of course, when you're getting ready to have chickens is to look at all these different breeds and think about what characteristics you'd like. Uh, one of the things I found is that the egg only breeds, uh, in particular, uh, one of the more famous ones, which is the uh, uh, leghorn, the white leghorn, they tend to be a little bit uh, nervous, they have a lot of kind of high strung energy. And so I might get an extra five or 10 eggs a year out of those breeds but it's not worth it. They're, they're skittish, they run away, they, they fight with the other chickens more. I tend to like breeds that are a little calmer and maybe their egg production isn't absolutely amazing, but it's still quite good. And the way that you tell that is either from a book, and I have some books I'll recommend in the resource document, or from websites. And I'm definitely gonna encourage you guys to check out one called backyardchickens.com they have this wonderful section, which is just all about breeds. And so you just Google a breed, Google, you, you search for a breed name on backyardchickens.com. And it starts out with a general description of them. And then it has everybody's reviews. It's just like you're on Amazon shopping for chickens. Well, I love these guys because they're so sweet. Or no, I didn't really like them because they were kind of nervous or they, you know, they got overheated in the summer all kinds of different information from chicken keepers about the different breeds. So the ones that I find I tend to gravitate towards are indeed what are called all purpose chickens, but for the most part, I'm not butchering them. I just like their personality. So think about that. And if you do want to uh, explore the area of meat only chickens, you'll probably want to go for one of those breeds that's specifically bred for that, they grow super fast. That's their, their real trademark. And you don't really care about the eggs. You're gonna butcher them young enough that they may have not have even started laying and you won't worry about whether or not their hens are roosters either. Um, but with most of us having backyard chickens, we're gonna primarily have hens and they start laying long after the point when you would have butchered the, uh, the meat chickens. 
So take a look at the websites and the books for lists of breeds and, and personalities of breeds. But the other question comes, so how long is this chicken going to produce eggs and what do I do when it stops producing them if I don't want to butcher the chicken? And the first answer is how long do they lay eggs is really not a clear answer because there is no point in the chicken's life in which they just stop. What happens is the production just kind of starts to trail off. So they generally don't start laying for about nine months, right? After you get them, you generally are gonna get them as baby chicks and they won't start laying for six to nine months. It depends on the breed and the conditions. But you know, the better part of half a year, then you start to get some eggs. And then in that first year, they are producing a lot. And by the second year, they're probably at their peak. And a hen at her peak um, of a good breed that is known for its egg production will give you about two eggs every three days. So that's how you think about how many chickens you need for your family. How many eggs does my family eat? If I have, let's say, three hens, Every three days, they're gonna give me six eggs, right? That's because there's three chickens producing two every three days. So two times three, six. So that means every week I'm gonna get maybe 13, 14 eggs. Is that enough for my family? 13, 14 eggs a week? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I want more. Maybe I wanna sell a couple dozen to a neighbor uh, under the table which don't worry about, nobody's gonna come up to your house with a siren and arrest you for selling eggs if you're just doing a few. And then you might wanna increase the number of hens you have. So think about that. So that's at the peak, two to three years, maybe four years at the most, they're laying two eggs every three days. Then it starts to drop off. And by five years, it's considerably dropped off. By six years, it's really, they're, they're very little. Some of them will have already died by six years. A lot of chickens could live seven or eight years. That's not unheard of. But basically somewhere in there in that four to eight year range, they'll probably die of old age. But if you are counting on a certain number of eggs and after the third year, let's say, that starts to drop off, now you're paying to feed them and you're not getting the eggs that you want. Yes, you're still getting the chicken manure. You're still getting help in the garden. So it may be perfectly fine for you. You may think, well, I don't care. These are pets. You know, these are my babies. And I love them and I gave them all names. And I would never consider doing anything with them other than just keeping them until they die of natural causes. And that's wonderful and you should absolutely do that. But there is a certain perspective which says these are actually livestock. They're not pets. The primary function that they have in my household, at least, is to produce eggs. And when they are not producing those eggs as much, I don't want to keep feeding them. So what do you do? Well, if you want to go to the step that I was talking about of learning how to butcher the chicken yourself and boil it, cook it, freeze it, all the, the process that you would go through, of course, you can do that. And there's equipment that you need and there's training that you need and so on. You could also see if somebody else would want to take them and do that with them. There is no easy, you know, butchermychickens.com where you can go and have that done. You would kind of need to ask around and talk to the feed store and see what you could do. I mean, there are these livestock refuges too, but they tend to want to take chickens that came from big time commercial operations who were guaranteed going to get slaughtered and rescue them. If they're taking from a small backyard operation, I don't know if they would be as interested. It may be true. I don't know a lot about those, those uh, wildlife refuge, I'm mean, sorry, livestock refuge uh, operations. So if you want to research that, you could do that. But basically just know this. At a certain point, they're going to start trailing off in their egg production, and you'll have to decide uh, what you're going to do about that. Um, if you do decide you want to butcher them, as I said, there is a way to learn to do it yourself. You have to have some equipment, not a ton, but uh, for example, to get the feathers off, you have to have a big pot that you can heat up with hot water. Most people like to do it outside. Uh, so that means some kind of outside burner, camp 
stove, something, and you're dipping the chicken briefly in this, uh, not boiling, but warm water so that it can be um, plucked, all the feathers can be plucked off and all that. But there are places, and I don't have any names on the tip of my tongue, but I know that they exist, uh, who have people who will take the chickens and butcher them for a fee. So you have to decide, you know, they'll give you the carcass back when they're done that you can cook, but you're paying them. So you have to decide if it's worth it for the fee. Uh, so that's another thing to research. That's essentially outsourcing your meat chickens. All right, so that's a, a lot to say about uh, egg producing breeds versus all purpose. Do the research on the breeds. And my quick answer is I prefer a number of the all-purpose breeds. I think they're wonderful. Now, do you have to have a rooster? First of all, as we said, <coughs> when we were talking about the uh, regulations, the municipal codes, there are a number of places where you simply cannot, whether you want to or not, it's not allowed. Um, well, in the Creek being one of them, and I'm not sure about other cities. And that is something that's kind of a little harder to slide by <laughs> and hope nobody notices because, you know, those guys will let everybody know that they're there. And by the way, the myth that the rooster crows only at sunrise, totally incorrect. He crows all day long. He just starts crowing when he wakes up at sunrise. Um, but throughout the day, he likes to announce that he's there and he's in charge. So you don't have to have a rooster at all because some people wonder about this. Don't the eggs have to be fertile in order for the chickens to lay any eggs at all. And that might be true with wild birds. Um, I'm not an ornithologist, but I think that that is the case. That the uh, hen doesn't have the signal to lay the egg unless it's been fertilized. Not the case with chickens. People have been messing around with chickens for thousands of years, and they've got them to the point where the hen will lay eggs her whole life if she never sees a rooster. It's kind of amazing if you think about what we've done to these animals in the crossbreeding over the years. The other thing is they lay eggs continuously. I mean, think of a wild bird, a songbird or something, a robin. They might lay one or two clutches of eggs a year, and that's it. And we have gotten our chickens to continuously lay day after day, 12 months a year. It's amazing. So they don't need a rooster to lay eggs. They will lay eggs perfectly fine. Are fertilized eggs better? Are they somehow more nutritious? There has been some talk about that, that some enzyme changes when the egg is fertilized. I have never seen any conclusive evidence that it makes a huge amount of difference. So it's up to you if you feel like you've got the research and you know, boy, oh boy, is it gonna make a big difference in my health and my family's health if I'm eating fertilized eggs, then you gotta figure out how to have a rooster. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, I have had roosters in the past. At the house we're at now, we don't have any. Um, and the hens are doing fine. Although there is a funny thing that I'll tell you that they do. So if, however, you want the hens to lay chicks, to produce chicks, sit on them, hatch them, and then you want to raise those chicks, of course, you do have to have a rooster. That's just, you know, nature. Got to have a mommy and a daddy. So the question is whether to have one really for the health of the hens, or the happiness of the hens, or to have one because you want to raise chicks. For no other reason do you need a rooster. And sometimes they can be mean. So there are certain roosters, it's, some people feel it's a breed thing, uh, and other people feel it's just a personality of an individual rooster, that they get very territorial, very tough, and they will come at you if you come in the chicken yard and sometimes it's a certain person that they've decided is a threat. Sometimes it's all people. Sometimes they can be taught to not do that. And sometimes they can't. So you kind of take your chances with the rooster. You see that on the back of his feet there, you see those nasty looking spurs? <laughs> he flings those out right at you when he comes towards you. Uh, hopefully you've never seen a cockfight. It's a very cruel and horrible thing, but that's what they use it for, to fight other males, and they will happily stick you with it if they can get to you, if they're a rooster of that kind, that kind of mean, aggressive rooster. So take that into account. I had a rooster once who was the sweetest, gentlest guy, never had a problem with him at all. So it's really up to you. One thing that is true, though, is that 
the hens are kind of used to having a rooster. It's, it's part of their psychology that every flock should have a rooster. And by the way, you don't need more than one unless you have 25 chickens. Uh, if you have anywhere, you know, between 10, 15, anywhere in that number, one rooster will be happy to have them all be his harem. If you have two, they literally have to figure out these are yours and these are mine. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> and there's a little jostling there for power and it gets kind of complicated. So for most backyard flocks that are not going to be more than 10 or 15 hens, one is fine. Whether, you know, even one, most people won't even have a rooster at all. I was just going to say that the hens without a rooster, after a certain point, some hens have been known to try to take on the role of the rooster. And uh, not they don't actually mount the other hens and try to mate with them, but they will try to crow. It's kind of hilarious. And they do this sort of pathetic half crow. You know, because it's just part of the social order and they're used to it. Another thing that will happen is they may think that you are the rooster. So if you come into the chicken yard and one of the hens kind of ducks down like this and puts her wings out, she is, uh, quote unquote, assuming the position. She's saying, you know, you can service me now. Uh, and and well, I do. I actually pet them a little bit and kind of pat them on the back so they have the illusion that something has happened. I don't, you know, smoke a cigarette afterwards. It, it makes them feel better. It's just like, oh, okay. That's right. In fact, one of the hens, after I do that, she kind of rustles her feathers like, oh, okay. You know, I don't say, was it good for you? But it's just, they, they have this dynamic. They have this psychology, the social structure that they have evolved with. So they do like it. That said, it's really okay if you don't have a rooster. All right. So now we have a question of how to structure the places where we keep these chickens. <clears throat> it's important to understand that chickens will eat anything that is green, unless it's a poisonous plant. They're actually pretty smart about that. Uh, there's a couple of other things. I think I did see one. Uh, it might have been uh, not not acanth agapanthus, I think. For some reason, they didn't like the leaves of that, and they left it. Just about everything else. So you notice in my chicken yard behind them there, it's totally bare. And so any weed that comes up is completely uh, hopeless, has no chance, it will be eaten. So if you have a coop, which is fairly small, and most coops are going to be, right, because you're not living on a three-acre property, they need some more space to roam besides just being in the coop. So you're going to need to create a chicken yard, and you need to be prepared for the fact that that chicken yard will be absolutely bare. It will have nothing in it, because they will eat every single green thing that sprouts, right? The other thing to be aware of is that, notice my second point there, the fences need to be six feet high. They will try to jump up or fly up over the fence. And if they are young enough and they haven't gotten very heavy, they might be able to do it if, they, if the fence was lower than six feet, right? So you want to keep the fences as high as six feet and you want to not have something with a low... Uh, branch or some kind of a stool or structure, a bucket, anything that's about three feet high, because that makes a nice little stepping stool. The chicken can sort of hop fly up on the top of the bucket thing at three feet, and then she can hop and fly over the fence. So keep all that stuff in from the edge of the fence so that they can't jump over. Now, I do really prefer the following in terms of predator proofing. I think your chicken yard, the outer part, does not need to be predator-proof, and your chicken coop absolutely does. And the reason for that is it's very hard to make a chicken yard predator-proof, and 99% of the predator issues you will have will be at night. And at night, they are inside the coop, and it's all locked up. So we'll talk about how you keep predators from getting inside, even if it's locked up. But basically, the fence that I have there that you see is just simple uh, fencing, six-foot fencing that goes around. There's nothing buried under the ground. It's not tacked down or nailed into the ground so nothing can dig under. Its function is simply to keep the chickens in. If a raccoon was to come along, he would climb over that fence in five seconds. 
but it's not designed to keep him out because he's not going to come during the day. Then the chickens are in the coop at night, and if he tries to get in there, he will have a problem, and we'll talk about that. So the coop itself, you also want to think about how much room the chickens have inside there. Uh, my rule of thumb here is four square feet per bird minimum and additional outside access. Now, some of the books will tell you that you could technically get away with two square feet or even, uh, sorry, three square feet or even two per hen. I think that's cruel. I think that's crowding them and they will be uncomfortable. So if you want to be humane and give them the best opportunity to thrive, go with the four square foot uh, rule per hen. Also notice here my checklist of good things for the coop, really good ventilation. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute, but you've got to have a lot of air flowing in and out. But then you need protection from predators. You need to be able to get into it so you can clean. There need to be laying boxes in there and space for them to roost and maybe a couple of extras if you can. Each of those we will illustrate specifically when we get to them. So let's start with the laying boxes. You need to understand the difference between laying and roosting or nesting and roosting. Nesting is what a chicken does when she wants to lay an egg. And she likes to get up off the ground a little bit, although they definitely will do it on the ground if that's their only option. Um, but she's happy to get up off the ground and that makes it easier for you. You can find the eggs and access them easily. But she also likes to be kind of secluded, to feel like she's sort of in hiding. So you notice what I did is I hung the cloth halfway down the opening of these laying boxes so that once she's sitting in there, her head is behind that cloth and it feels kind of secluded, like you're under a bush. But when she's getting into it, when she's exploring and saying, what is this place? She can see in there. If the curtain comes all the way down, she can't even tell there's anything in there. Now, some people do have a curtain that goes all the way down, but they lift it up and tack it out of the way for the first couple of months so the chickens get used to going in and out. Then they drop the cloth down. The chicken now thinks, well, wait a minute, but then there used to be something inside there, and they start poking their head through, and they will go in. I don't find that that's necessary, um, but you could try that if you really want to. But I think it's fine to have it halfway down, uh, because if it's all the way down, they, they may not realize that there's anything there. It looks like a wall. You know, the poor things have a brain the size of a walnut. So let's give them a break. There, there is a reason for the term bird brain. They do their best, but we do need to help them with, <laughs> help them along, so accommodations as we would call it. So there's your laying box. They're 12 inches square, and I recommend one for every four birds. So these four boxes are enough for 16 hens. If all you can get is a set of four and you're only gonna have 10 hens, that's fine. It's not the end of the world. But if you're going to have 10 hens and only have one laying box, you may have a problem because they'll, they'll start to fight over it and try to get in. And if somebody's in there, it's sort of like, you know, somebody's in the bathroom, I'm not coming out till I'm done. Then the hen who has to lay will go somewhere else and she'll start laying on the ground. And that could be a problem. If they have access to the eggs after they lay, and if everybody does as they're walking around in the coop, uh, they may step on them. They may actually learn to eat them. We'll talk a little more about that in a second. So it's really better to have enough laying boxes uh, that that, you know, four boxes, no waiting, right? So that when somebody has to go, there's an empty box for them, right? So that's the reason for the one box per four birds. Do you have to access them from the back? Well, no, especially if your coop is big enough that you can walk inside of it like mine. In fact, there's no reason to. However, if the boxes are inside the coop rather than hanging outside, and I'll, I'll show you a design with that, but mine, they're not hanging outside. So when I just attached them to the wall, just the square boxes, there was a nice flat roof on top of the boxes. Well, guess what? Chickens love to jump up and climb up on anything they can find. They're always curious. They're exploring their spaces. So they will jump up on top of that nice flat roof <coughs> of the laying boxes and they'll poop all over it, right? So then you got chicken poop all over the top of your laying boxes and it's a big mess and it's no good. So that is why you see I put this very steeply sloped roof 
And there's actually a space inside there. There's an, what you might call attic space. It's just empty space uh, because the boxes themselves have a flat roof. But I put this really steep roof so they will not be tempted to jump up on top. Uh, if you do have a smaller coop and you're trying to save space, of course, then mounting the boxes on the outside with an opening only from the inside will save you some space. So that's a little bit about boxes. Now, roosting, which is different from nesting, is what they do at night. And they also have this instinct to get up high. In fact, that instinct to be off the ground when you roost is much stronger than the instinct to be off the ground when you lay eggs. As I say, they can lay on the ground, and, and, and ancestral chickens probably did, but it's more convenient for us as chicken keepers to have them up off the ground in the box. Roosting, they really want to be off the ground. So you create something like this where you have these poles. I use natural uh, branches just because it kind of looks cool. And I, I don't know, maybe the chickens like it better. But there's really nothing wrong with using uh, dowels or uh, even square thin two by twos maybe. But, you know, it's a little easier for them to grip something that's round. So I'm, I'm going to recommend those. You'll see lots of coop designs. But the point is, I've got enough space for 10 inches of linear roosting space per chicken. The poles are spaced 18 inches apart. There's three of them. And it is hilarious because everybody wants to be on the top pole. So for the first 20 minutes, they're jostling around. No, you got to no, I want to be up. And, and obviously, they can't all fit. I mean, I started out with 15 hens. I, I now have a lot less than that. But when I had 15 hens, all 15 of them were trying to fit on the top pole. And it literally took them 20 minutes to kick out the poor uh, lower on the order guys who then had to go down to the second and third poles. But eventually they will settle down and being off the ground at all makes them happy. Now notice my little caption here, the entire roosting pole assembly can be lifted off the floor to rake manure. That is because they do a tremendous amount of pooping while they're sleeping, right? That's what they do at night. A lot of pooping, a lot of chicken manure builds up under the roosting poles. So it's really great that I can literally hinge, see the hinges are here, and I can literally pick this up and hook it to the window so that I can get up under there. And in short term, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks, I simply stir the manure into the bedding. Longer term, when I'm cleaning out the coop, I can actually uh, get in there and actually scoop out the, the hay and manure mixture. So that brings us to the topic of bedding because you don't want your hands just walking around on a bare floor. Well, it's not, I shouldn't say that. Some people do, some people have a wire floor. I think that really hurts their feet. I don't like the fact that the manure then falls through the wire floor underneath the coop and attracts flies. The interesting thing is if the hens have access to the manure, if they can get to it, they will eat the fly larva. So yes, the flies will come and lay their eggs on the manure and then the chickens will eat the larva. They're literally controlling the pests. If the manure falls through, especially if it's an area under the coop that's not accessible for some reason, like you've wired it off, then the flies have a field day and they'll go nuts in there and you'll have a big fly problem. So I don't like to use bare floors, but what should you put on your floor? And you will see lots of different suggestions in all kinds of different places. Some people use sand. Some people use different kinds of sawdust. I actually like to use hay with the understanding that hay can be dustier. So you will get kind of a layer of dust that develops on your laying boxes, on the doors, on every piece of furniture in the coop. But it's cheap, it mixes well with the manure, it's very high in carbon so that when the high nitrogen manure mixes with it, you have great compost, it just works really well. Now, if you have access to leaves from deciduous trees, especially oak leaves, those are wonderful too. And so I do throw a fair amount of oak leaves in my coop as well. But what I wanted to talk to you about is this concept of a deep litter floor. This is something that uh, a number of people advocate and other people don't like. I like it because it's much more natural. What is happening is there is nothing underneath that bedding but bare dirt. I literally did not build a floor on the coop. I simply filled it with a huge thick layer of hay. And as the hens work that hay around, scratch it, scratch their own manure into it, and mix it up, they're making a sheet of compost. The bacteria that grow in that compost 
there is research that actually shows that that's healthier for the chickens to live in that environment. It actually coexists with their immune system and keeps them healthier. So I really like that method. And then periodically, and in my case, I'm lazy, so it ends up being no more than about once every six months, maybe even once every nine months, I scrape out that hay and manure mixture, let it compost for a little while in a pile, and then use it on my garden. So that's the way that I deal with the manure. There are plenty of people who have a wire floor, manure falls through, they collect it a lot, like every three days, every four or five days at the most, you don't want to let it sit for long. And they cart it over to somewhere else and they mix it with carbon sources like hay and leaves and they make their compost that way. But that's too much work. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I happily use the deep litter method and I don't have time to go on and on about that. So I recommend you look into this deep litter method. I will say something about the fact that because there's a bare dirt floor, not a built floor, uh, predators could dig under. So we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's a quick thing on bedding, but we should touch quickly on feeding them. Water is crucial. It's certainly crucial for every animal, but it's very crucial for chickens, especially in the hot summer. So you want to change the water often. There are different types of waterers. Let's see if I have a, oh, you saw it. Actually, it was in my, uh, this one, here we go. This one with the loop handle, is a waterer. This one over here has the food in it. So this is the kind of waterer that I like, which creates kind of a vacuum seal when you put the outer part on, and then it, the water fills this trough. As they drink from it, the water continues to flow down and fill the trough until it's empty. You are going to need to keep an eye on that and keep it filled. You're also going to need to keep it clean, right? It will start to get a little grotty after a while. Now, there are other kinds of waterers that are, uh, are automatic, like you have a hose going to it, and there's a little float, and as the level goes down, it fills it back up. If you want to get fancy like that, it's wonderful. It will keep you from having to worry, oh, God, did I change the chicken's water in the summer? Uh, the other thing, however, is if you forget to change the water, they will let you know. They will come right up to the fence and yell at you when they're really thirsty or hungry or unhappy in some other way. But it's not good to get to that point, right? It's not good for their system to be dehydrated and then rehydrated and dehydrated. So we don't want that. We want to keep the waters full and clean. And then the feeders, of course, that's very simple. Sorry, go back. That's very simple. You just uh, fill them with food. Now you notice both of these are hanging. The feeder is easy. The feeder has this Nice little looped handle with a little uh, indentation in it for the hook, and I hang it up. Simple. The waterer is actually not meant to hang, which puzzles me. I don't understand how people do this because the recommendation is that you put the feeder up on a couple of bricks. You want it to be off the ground enough that they can just come over and dip their beak into it without getting all the way down to the ground where they will scratch and knock hay and bedding into it and poop in it and mess it up. Well, if you just put that waterer on a couple of bricks to get it off the ground, they will jump up on top of it, right? Remember, they jump up on everything. This is their great love, is to explore the upper dimensions. So up they are now sitting on top of your water, and they turn around and look out at the world and let a nice big blob of chicken manure fall down in the water, right? Remember, they just they poop on everything, right? They have no toilet manners. So I don't understand how people can do that without having to constantly clean chicken manure out of their waterer. My solution is to hang the waterer as well, just as you are hanging the feeder, hang the waterer. But know this, this little handle here is not meant to have a hook on it. It's, you know, smooth. And so if the water gets tilted even slightly, the uh, hook will slide to one end of that handle. And now the water is tilted like this, and all the water runs out. And within three hours, your chickens have nothing to drink. So my solution is to take a file and saw, file a little groove in the center of that handle. So now the hook snaps into place and holds it exactly level. So there's my little hack for you for hanging the water. <laughs> I do recommend it. Um, just quickly about feed. 
if you want to get fancy with feed, you can. You can learn about all the different nutrients that the chickens need. You can try to, you know, add some of the things that you grow in your, you know, if you have space to grow grain type of crops and things like that. It can get very complicated. Most of us are just going to start out buying some food at the feed store, and there's nothing wrong with that. The two main types in terms of size and structure are pellets and crumbles. I prefer the pellets because when chickens eat, they're kind of messy. They shake their head around, and with the crumbles, they throw them all over. The pellets, if they spill some, they can see it, and they'll go pick it up and eat it, so you waste less. You don't want to give them the laying food, the food that's designed for laying hens, until they are maybe six months old or so. Their livers cannot handle the amount of calcium that is in those laying mixes. So when they're baby chicks, give them chick food. When they're layers, switch to laying food. And I prefer the pellets. There are organic brands, certified organic brands. There's natural, and of course, there's regular old Purina chicken chow. Uh, I have one that I like that is actually not organic. It's natural. Uh, it has no GMOs in it, but it's very nutritionally complete. That question of how much am I paying for food and how many, how much money am I saving by getting eggs is a very interesting one. And if you're just blithely buying the food at the feed store, don't think too hard about it because you might, <laughs> you might actually be paying more for your eggs than you would if you got them at the grocery store. But remember, there's all these wonderful benefits of having hens besides the eggs. If you do want to get those economics right, then think about the possibility of having enough chickens that you produce a few more eggs than you can use every few days until you got a dozen or two dozen you can sell to the neighbors. And then you got enough money to pay for the food. And so now you're getting free eggs. That's one way to think about it. There's a lot of ways to do the economics of the, of the food. Now, can you give them other food from your kitchen, extra scraps and things? Oh, yes. They love it all. There's really only a couple of exceptions that I don't give them. I don't give them uh, citrus peels. They don't really like those, so they just sort of sit there on the ground and dry out. And I don't give them onion or garlic skins uh, or coffee grounds or tea leaves. But just about everything else they will happily eat, including, oddly, meat. Yeah. Now, chickens are omnivores, understand. They're not purely vegetarian. Their absolute favorite thing in the entire universe is to find a bug and eat it, right? So that's a sort of a form of being a carnivore. But really, any kind of meat, if you throw bones out there, they will pick them clean. Even if they're chicken bones, how weird is that? Now, then you'll have bones sitting around in your chicken yard. It looks a little weird. Uh, so most people don't do that, but you can. The thing you don't want to give them is really rotten stuff, stuff that's completely just slimy, spoiled. Might be a little toxic. A few little blemishes on something, the outer leaves from something, vegetables, things like that, fruit that's got a little soft, no problem. Right? If they're healthy, if they have strong immune systems, not an issue. Should you give them their own eggshells? Well, the food that you're giving them, if it's laying mix, is high in calcium. So they don't need the calcium from the eggshells. They can eat them. And if you're doing your own food mix, you may want to add the calcium, although some people also put a, a cuttlefish in there, which gives them calcium. But the thing you want to be careful of is not training them to eat eggs. So don't just take a couple of empty eggshells and throw them in there. That looks too much like an egg. And after they peck at that for a while and eat it, they might see an unbroken egg that somebody else laid or even their egg and go, oh, yeah, I remember that was kind of tasty, wasn't it? And start eating it. So if you're going to feed them eggshells, crumble them up really well so they're almost like powder. Let them dry a little bit. Crumble them up. Then the chickens don't associate that with a fresh egg. Now, if you want to have chickens, you almost certainly have to start with chicks. And it's a little bit of extra work. And of course, it's lots of fun because they're so cute. But do be prepared for what you're going to need, right? First of all, you want to think about the breeds. Like we said earlier, some of the feed stores will get this breed this week and another breed next week. They don't always tell you the schedule. Um, but if you're buying them from mail order, you have to get a lot. There's a minimum. So most people who are starting out small go to the store. Concord Feed right here. In Concord is good. Uh, you guys probably have some 
feed stores there in Solano County. Those of you from out of the area will have to look up your sources. But in any case, you want to immediately, as soon as you get them, either bring them home or they arrive in the mail, get them in a warm environment, right? So you want a lamp or something hanging over their box. You want it to be 90 degrees the first week, right? They have no flight feathers at all. They have these little fluffy feathers. What they are evolved to do is get up under mama's wing where it's nice and warm. And she's not there, so they have to have that lamp. Yes, it is okay that the light is on all day long. They will still go to sleep. It's hilarious. They just literally nod off in place. So don't worry about the day-night cycle thing. You want them to stay warm. And you do that by lowering or raising the lamp, right? So if they all are huddling under directly under the lamp and they won't go anywhere else in the box, it's not warm enough. Lower it a little. If they're all out in the corners, it's too hot and they don't want to get under it, so raise it a little. But you can literally put a thermometer in the box and see, 90 degrees the first week, and start lowering it five degrees per week until it's down to 65 degrees, and then you can keep it there, okay? But as they get older, remember they're always constantly jumping up on things? You want to put something on top of the box. And it might be tricky to have the lamp in there with the wire, whatever you've laid on top of the box, that allows the lamp to still go through, but you'll figure it out, two pieces of, of wiring or something like that, because if you don't, they will hop out. Once they get a big enough, they'll start exploring and they'll hop out. Always give them lots of water. You'll have to clean the waterers constantly. It's, it's annoying because they're scratching and kicking stuff into the water. They're jumping up on top, like we talked about with the big waterers and pooping in the water but you've got to keep them hydrated. They will not live long if you let the water run out. And when you first bring them home, sometimes they need to even be taught to drink, which you can do by gently dipping their beak in the water. And they're like, wait a minute, where did that come from? And they want to go back and do it again. It takes a few times sometimes, and you always have a few dumb ones that take longer to learn, but I have successfully taught chicks to drink. Um, many times they've been at the feed store for several days. They've already learned what to do. They run right over to the waterer and, and use it. <clears throat> you definitely want a feeder like the one you see here that has head holes. Otherwise, they'll jump in there and scratch around and kick the food out and poop in it. So again, this one is somebody just made one out of cardboard, but you can get metal ones with the little head holes in it. I like the corn cob granules for bedding because uh, it's not too soggy. It stays dry even though they're pooping and peeing in it and spilling the water all over. Um, there's some other beddings, but try not to get something that's really uh, soggy. Don't let it get too wet. You can actually have mold diseases that will uh, be bad for their health. Remember, though, at a certain point, you're going to have to transition them into the coop. Now, the easiest way with chicks is if you have no other chickens, then there's no worry about social order or the old ones being mean to the new ones, but you want them to get used to the coop first. So the best way is after they're uh, out of their box, and usually I start with a medium-sized box, and then I go to a giant box before they're ready to be transitioned out to the coop. You know, at, at that point, I would say they're probably uh, five weeks old, maybe. They've been in the box five, six weeks. Um, sometimes I get really impatient, and I want to take them out after four weeks, but it's better for them to be a little bigger. They grow fast. It's amazing. But now what I do is I literally lock them in the coop and they just live inside the coop. They can't get into the chicken run at all. They, the waterer's there, the food's there. They don't need the laying boxes. They're not gonna be laying for a while, but they get used to it. It feels homey to them. And I'm talking about weeks. Like I might leave them in there for three weeks. They never come out to the chicken yard. Then I'll open the coop door during the day, let them come out and They'll be like, what the heck is, where is the, I've never seen this place before. This is amazing. Now, how do I get back to that other place that was so nice and had the food in it? And they will not necessarily realize that the opening that they came out is the way to get back in. So you might actually have to pick them up and put them back in the coop. But a couple of times of doing that, they'll get the idea and the smart ones figure it out and the dumb ones follow them. So then they'll be comfortable moving back and forth between coop and chicken yard. All right, so uh, they will start laying between 18 and 24 weeks. 
Uh, they typically lay two every three, which we already said. You don't have to refrigerate the eggs right away. Don't worry that you have to run in the house and put them in the fridge. In Europe, people don't even refrigerate their eggs. They're just right on the shelf next to the breakfast cereal because they don't wash off the protective coating that is naturally put onto the egg as it comes out of the chicken. So <clears throat> you don't do that either, unless the egg is really filthy. You don't need to wash them. So yeah, you can refrigerate them once you bring them in the house, but don't feel stress about it. If you go a couple of days, the eggs will be fine. Now, if a hen does start eating her own eggs, it's hard because there's not a lot you can do. The first thing to do is to collect the eggs as often as you can. After I just told you not to worry about collecting the eggs because of sanitation, collect them because the, then the hens don't have as much time spent looking at them and thinking, well, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. Maybe if I pecked it, it would be food, right? Remember, bird brain. So collect the eggs, you know, every day. Some of them will still figure it out. It has happened to me twice. And a lot of the books and things will tell you, too bad, you just got to kill them or give them away or something. We can never be taught not to eat eggs. Um, but I have found that if you take the eggs away, if you know which chicken is doing it and you take her off the nest quickly, maybe you can break the habit. I also had a chicken once who stopped laying over the winter, which I'll mention in a second. And when she started laying again in the spring, she had forgotten about eating eggs. So that's nice. But there's no easy solution <coughs> if they start doing that. Uh, we don't have to cover fertile eggs and other weird egg types. One thing, broody hens, it means that the chicken thinks that she is going to hatch the eggs, right? This is the instinct to sit and sit and sit and sit and hatch these chicks. I'm not getting up till there's chicks. And some breeds are more prone to this than others. I have a breed called a Buff Orpington. Every year, one of the Buff Orpingtons gets broody. And it's annoying because, A, they stop laying, right? They're not actually laying any more eggs at that point. And, B, that laying box is not available. The other hands can't use it because they never leave it. They might come out once a day just to poop and, and uh, eat a little bit and drink, but then they go right back. So what do you do? Well, the books will tell you. You've got to break that habit immediately. As soon as you see a broody hen, you pull her off the nest. It's too hard. You, you're just not going to notice in time. You're not going to be able to go out to your coop every few hours and pull her back off the nest. So what I do is when I notice, when I'm in there, I take her off, and she looks all kind of disoriented and weird, like, Where? what happened? And then 10 minutes later, she jumps back on. And the next day, if I see her, I pull her off. And I might have to do that for a week, but eventually she'll – she'll break the habit. So for me, the real solution to broody hens is to look for breeds that are not so likely to be broody, unless you want to raise your own chicks, and then you want the broody ones. In fact, the books and the websites that compare breeds will tell you which ones are good mothers, right? You want a, a type that's a good mother. Okay, we need to wrap it up here. So I just want to say health is easy if you have lots of good ventilation. If you keep the manure mixed well with uh, the bedding, don't let it build up and give them plenty of space. Don't worry so much about chicken diseases and all the things you see in the books about what am I going to do with this or that disease. It's really not a common problem with healthy backyard flocks. Don't use pesticides. Don't If you spray your garden with pesticides, don't let them in that area. And then the question of dust boxes. I don't need that because I have a yard where they can find holes. The first time I saw a chicken do this, I did think it was really sick. And I was like, oh, God, I have to take it to the vet. Because they look terrible. They're splaying out on the ground, spreading their wings, lying all out on their sides. And what they're doing is they're working dirt down into the base of their feathers, up against their skin. And that controls various skin pests, lice, and things like that. It's a wonderful natural habit that they have. And if you have spaces in your chicken yard where they can do this, they'll just do it. The dusting box that's mentioned here is only if they do not have access to the bare ground anywhere. Some people will put a box <coughs> with diatomaceous earth or other things like that in it, inside the coop and let the chickens use it. But you have to maintain it and they'll scratch around and they'll knock other stuff into it. And it's much easier to just have some bare areas in the chicken yard. But don't worry, these chickens are not dying. Uh, you do need lots of shade for them, especially in our area where it gets hot in the summer. You can actually mist the chicken yard and the coop to cool it down on super hot days. 
But remember, cold is not a big issue in our area. We do not have deep freezes, and they are walking around wearing a down jacket all day long. They can stay a lot warmer than you without any clothes. So keeping them cool, much more important than keeping them warm, at least in the Bay Area. Uh, and one of the most important things is having ventilation in your coop. <clears throat> and if you're worried, oh, I got all these windows in the coop, it's going to get so cold at night, I have to go out and close the windows every night. No, you don't. They'll be just fine. Let them be, right? Unless you notice that it's really freezing in there. And you can read more about chickens and cold. And some parts of the country, they get frostbite, and it is an issue, but uh, not in our area. Here's a couple of coop designs. We'll just zip through those real quick. This one you cannot get into. You just have to reach in. That's what this door in the back is for. I don't like it because you can't clean it out easily. You have to lean in there to get the stuff. But if you have no other space, you have no way to do it any larger than this, go for it. It's still a workable design. You notice the laying box mounted on the outside to save floor space. You've got a door at the back or a hinged roof where you reach in and get the eggs. But the wire floor, the manure falling through, or else the wire, the manure collecting on the floor and having to be scraped out, both of those are not ideal. All openings covered with half-inch hardware cloth. <coughs> that goes for every single coop design. That's what keeps the predators out. Not chicken wire. Chicken wire is designed to keep chickens in, not raccoons out. So chicken wire is too flimsy, too big of an opening. Use hardware cloth. Very stiff, I don't know why it's called cloth. It's wire mesh. It is half inch heavy wire mesh. And you wanna cover all openings that a predator could use with that half inch hardware cloth on any of these designs. Now this one you can walk into, which I like. The nesting boxes are inside, they're not mounted on the wall. But it has a regular wood floor, so it still needs lots of scraping and cleaning of the droppings fairly frequently. Um, but it's up, notice how it's up off the ground. So that wood floor, any predator would, went under there would not be able to get in because there's plywood all the way across. But it's tricky to maintain that floor in a healthy way. Uh, it can get wet, it can get moldy. It's just, I don't prefer it. So this one is similar to what I have where there's the deep litter floor. The thing that I do though, because the floor is bare, there's no, nothing underneath is I bury the hardware cloth six inches wide all the way around the, I staple it to the outside and then I dig a trench down and bury it coming out six inches. So predators cannot dig to get up underneath, which in this case, if they could, they could tunnel up all the way underneath because remember there's nothing but bare dirt under there. So you do wanna have that all the way around, hardware cloth six inches buried at, coming out so the digging predators, which is primarily foxes, will not get under. Raccoons don't dig. Raccoons um, MO is to slowly work on any little weakness in the window or the latch. All night long, they'll fuss and pull and wiggle and push to try to get underneath or open something. The fox just starts trying to dig. And by the way, those are the main predators I worry about. I don't really have any um, predatory birds Issues, I've never had that. Some people talk about Cooper's hawks trying to actually fly down and take their chicken. That would be a really stupid Cooper's hawk because it could not lift a chicken. Uh, if you had the little chicks out in the yard, they, they would, but of course, little chicks should not be out in the yard. A couple other little things I like is an isolation room if you have space for it. This poor thing had been beat up by a, her flock that she lived with, and so her owner brought her to me, and I kept her in there. The sad thing is she, my flock would have beat her up too, when they see anybody who looks weak or uh, injured, they go after them. It's, it's really survival of the fittest. So I kept her in there by herself, and she healed up and joined the flock and was fine. But it's nice to have a little isolation room. And if you do get to the point of raising your own chicks, you can use that for the mother and the babies. I also have a storage room where I keep the accessories, the food, a couple of other little things. It's nice to have that in there as well. That's the only room in the whole coop that has an actual floor. You see the, the floor is built there. Okay, I'm a little late, but we almost made it. And uh, I appreciate everybody's time. That's my email and that's what I actually look like. No, not really. But uh, I, will, <laughs> I will be available for questions. And then uh, afterwards, I can maybe take a crack at the questions that were in the chat. 
So there we came to a screeching halt. I'll stop my share and turn it back to you, Allison. <laughs> Great, Tyler. No, thank you. Um, and I just, we wanted to remind those of you who are in here, if you go in that participants box and you use the raise hand button, we will give you priority. Um, I just, we had a couple of questions that um, kind of related to what you were just talking about. Someone was asking about how easy it would be to add an adult hen to an established flock of five. Do you have any tips on that? Very good question, and the answer is not easy, unfortunately. They are not nice to newcomers. They really are not. So if you just throw one hen in by herself, uh, they will go after her bad, and they, they may literally kill the hen. It's kind of awful. Uh, or at least peck her until she's bleeding. So what do you do? Well, there's a couple of strategies. If you have a certain number that you're introducing and there's nothing you can do about it, it's one uh, coming into five or two coming into 10 and there's just literally nothing you can do, then I would try to create a situation, hopefully inside your coop, in which there is a barrier that they can see through. So some kind of fencing or wire mesh and the newcomers are on one side and the old guys are on the other side. Now, you have to have food and water and maybe even a nesting box if, you're in, if your newcomer is of laying age on both sides of the partition. And does anybody get to go out the door to the chicken yard? Only the old guys, not the newcomer? Maybe which side, you know, where's the door in relationship to this partition? But my point is, if you can set it up that way, and leave it there for quite a while, like a couple of weeks, they will start to get used to each other. And it's not guaranteed that when you take the partition away, they won't go after her, but hopefully a lot less aggressively. Uh, I have also had some success, believe it or not, with training them to leave her alone, leave the newcomers alone, by using a squirt bottle. And this is great if you have kids. It's summertime, the kids can just sit around all day, keep an eye on the chicken, because as soon as the old guys start going after the newcomer. You squirt them with the squirt bottle. They hate that. They don't like water on them at all. And they're like, where the heck did that come? That was horrible. They don't realize you're doing it, but they'll stop. And then they'll start up again. You squirt them again. And it takes a while, uh, but it can be done. Now, the best thing is if you can manage it, have the newcomers outnumber the old guys, right? So if your flock is only three or four at some point, maybe you started out with a few more and they dwindled get eight new chickens and those eight will form sort of a critical mass and the big guys are like well okay i guess we better leave them alone i don't know who they are but there's too many of them and they actually kind of work it out and then eventually they will integrate completely and create their social structure and all that but if the if the newcomers can outnumber the old ones uh that's a pretty good method uh it's often difficult to achieve that uh, because of whatever your circumstances are, but it's not easy. They're they're interesting in their social interactions. That's great. Uh, so we do have one person with the hand raised, and John, I'm going to unmute you in a second. I want to remind everybody on the call, Nicole has shared a survey link. I think she's going to share that again. Um, this helps us not only in reporting back what you know, you've enjoyed what brought you to the talk, but also in planning future talks, um, topics you're interested in, that sort of thing. So she's going to share that link there. And John, I'm going to unmute you. It will take a second. Um, and you should be off mute now if you want to ask your question. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about keeping the flies down. That's uh, something somebody else asked, and I think that's a valid i'm sorry you said feeding what keeping i'm sorry keeping <laughs> keeping the flies down um there's a lot of them and my wife's not a big fan of that even though she loves the chickens yeah well that brings up really the whole question of of smell and flies right there are definitely people who are like oh god i can never have chickens because it's gonna this whole yard's gonna stink and the neighbors will smell it so the first thing before i even say anything about flies is what I was saying about giving them access to the bedding and letting them scrape, scratch it around and mix it up. Because what you're doing at that point is creating what we call aerobic decomposition. 
aerobic composting means it has oxygen present and that's the kind that doesn't smell right it's the layers of stinky wet stuff that produce the smell so first of all give them access to that and that also helps a lot with flies because as i said they will eat the fly larva in the manure but you're going to have to clean it out as well so and and i will say that certain times of year i've noticed I'll have a little flock of flies buzzing around for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, they, they managed to escape the chickens in some corner somewhere and they hatched and then they're gone. I, I don't have these huge clouds of flies all the time. They don't go anywhere else in the yard. They're not a, a vector for flies in the rest of my garden. As long as the chickens can access the bedding, scratch it around, as long as I'm not too lazy and I actually go out there and, and rake it into the bedding every week or so, maybe two, and then actually uh, clean it out and compost it properly in a, in a pile uh, every six to nine months, flies should not be an issue. Really, a confinement in small spaces where they can't get access to the manure, that's uh, gonna be a problem. That's gonna be a source of flies. Thank you. So let's see, we've got two more questions uh, or two more raised hands. So Refugio, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, you should be ready to ask or able to. Oh, hi. <laughs> so my question, I mean, there's like several, but uh, the main one is we finished our coop um, about a week and a half ago and the girls have been going in there and uh, in the run, just kind of being outside to get used to it. Um, my question is, they're seven weeks now. Are they allowed to go in the coop and sleep there? Someone told me I had to wait three months, and I was like, that seems like a very long time. That doesn't make any sense why anyone would give you a time limit when they could be in the coop. Uh, so what are they doing at night right now? Um, actually, I have them here with me. Let me un... Oh, you have them in the house? Yeah, they're in... Um... They're right here next to me. Yeah. And so they sleep here during the day and then they're outside in the coop. Um, I mean, sorry, they're outside in, uh, during the day and they sleep in here, yeah. Well, if your uh, coop is predator proof, yeah. then it's perfectly reasonable to put them in there at even at night, okay. um, at seven weeks, eight weeks. Uh, the thing that you wanna make sure is that it's predator proof. Now, there's an interesting transition point. You know, when they are chicks, their instinct is to huddle together on the ground and sleep together in a little wonderful little ball. Yeah. And there is just a certain point when they get to a particular age, maybe it's eight weeks, 10 weeks, I don't remember, when the instinct to get up on a roosting pole and roost and sleep that way kicks okay. in. Um, but it doesn't matter if you put them in the coop now and they're not interested in the roosts, they'll just sleep on the floor like they do in your container. Yeah, they do start like doing the roosting stuff, but some the the person that told me was a feed guy, and he said that the reason why is because sometimes they'll lay on top of each other and they'll suffocate one, which is because if they're too cold. So that's why I was I've been keeping them inside at night. But it yeah, I, well, I haven't heard of that happening. Yeah. I think that might be an issue with the really little babies, maybe. Yeah. Um, and again, in our area, especially this time of year, is really perfect. It's just not that cold. Yeah. Uh, and they have, you know, so they've got about half their flight feathers now, wouldn't you say, at this age? Oh, yeah, definitely. They, yeah. So the that's what keeps them warm. I, yeah, the only thing I see is when they flap their wings and they, I see the little armpits. And so yeah. that's the only little part. Fuzz but, under there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they've got plenty of feathers to keep them warm. They should be fine. But, you know, maybe the feed store guys know something I don't. I've never heard of, of that being an issue. I think because Sassoon Fairfield, which is where I live, it's really high winds at night. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, maybe that's why. But I, th I feel like I made my coop pretty, like this is the inside of the coop. Oh yeah, that's very snug. Now, do you have some openings for ventilation? Yeah, so we, uh, we um, I do, it's a door that opens, um, barn doors that open like this during the day and has a, a half inch screen to let air flow in. And then it also closes completely, and it has a big door that opens uh, So if I need to clean it. Well, that's good for cleaning. You do want to keep some ventilation uh, even at night. You know, the manure can start to build up uh, ammonia if it's in sitting in piles. Yeah. And uh, you want a little bit of fresh air moving 
uh, to keep that from building up. Birds are very sensitive to toxic gases, I, I guess is the way to say it. Yeah. I mean, you've heard of the canary in a coal mine. Yeah. So when we start to smell, when we go as humans into the coop and start to smell ammonia, it's mm -hmm. already at a very high, uh, potentially toxic level for them. So just, uh, you know, keep as much ventilation as you can, uh, obviously with predator protection. Yeah, because I do have, as you can see, like this is a ventilation on all yeah, time. Yeah, that's good. And then this is like ventilation during the day Yeah, that's well. very good. Okay. I think I'll they're going to be sure. very happy. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. I appreciate Great. that. You bet. Okay, well, we have one more raised hand, and I know we're coming up on 8.30, so um, I'm going to unmute this hand, but I wanted to remind everyone that we are keeping track of the questions in the chat, and so we'll send Tyler some of your questions and see if we can uh, get a blog for some, some additional answers since there's so many good questions tonight. So this uh, next hand is iPhone. So you are now unmuted if you want to ask your question. Whoever's the iPhone with their hand raised. It's all iPhones everywhere. <laughs> I don't know. Well. Maybe they hit the hand raise button accidentally. Yeah, that could be. Um, do you want to just wave at me if you didn't want to? Yeah, you're lowering hand now, or, or did you have a question? Oh, I think you might be on mute on your phone because you are unmuted on here. So you <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's there's always always some technical issue. Apologies. So. Was, there was a little question about that I noticed in the chat about can you buy hens all ready to lay? Um, good luck. Everybody wants that, <laughs> and it's really hard to find. Uh, I did used to get them from the guy at the little farm in Tilden Park in Berkeley uh, because every year he had to bring in a bunch of new little baby chicks for Easter, so he was getting rid of his year-old hens. But that's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to find, and they uh, can be kind of expensive. So. Most cases, unless you have a great source, you should probably just prepare for the chick experience. We're gonna try with the iPhone one more time and then that, that'll that be it. I, I'm seeing iPhone on here twice, so I'm not sure if it's the same iPhone. Um, do you wanna try now? Hi. Hi. Hi, I was uh, going to ask, sorry about that. I was going to ask about the rooster issue. Uh, we bought some chicks and we, um, unfortunately, in one of the flock um, is a rooster. Yep, <laughs> it happens. So uh, what they tell you when you get the sexed, sexed chicks, that means mm -hmm. the feed store is trying to determine their sex. They tell you that they can get about 98% certain that a chick is a hen, but not 100%. So we uh, had a couple of roosters reveal themselves in our one of our previous flocks, come out of the closet as a rooster. And so we <laughs> called them the 2% solution because <laughs> you never know. And so that will happen. And if you were not planning to have roosters, you're gonna have to figure out what to do. Uh, if you, again, we've, the whole question of, you know, eating chickens and meat, if you believe that that's okay, you could try to find some place that would take them for that purpose, or you could think about doing it yourself. Um, but you want to do it pretty quickly because they'll start exhibiting their rooster behavior after a few weeks. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, if you're giving them away, unfortunately, one thing that can happen is people will find a, an ad in next door or wherever you post it for a rooster, and those people are going to use the rooster for cockfighting. Oh. So, and that's horrible and cruel, and you do not want to support that. Well, how do you know? They're not going to say. They're going to say, oh, yeah, it's just for me in my backyard, you know? So trying to get a little sense of who they are. You might even ask if you can visit where they keep their chickens. It's hard. I mean, I've heard one person say, well, if they have kids, then that's a good sign that they're not 
doing cockfighting is no guarantee, I guess. So that's a thing to think about. But yeah, you, you have to get rid of them unless you're planning to keep roosters. And you can keep a rooster if you can keep a rooster, right? Is it allowed in your area? Are your neighbors okay with the noise? All that. But there's no guarantee uh, with the baby chicks. 98%, but not guaranteed. <laughs> So we're in uh, Vallejo, and uh, I believe you can keep a rooster, if uh -huh. I'm not sure. Well, you can look into it, um, but the neighbors have to be okay with it, too. Even if it's technically allowed on the books and the neighbors really start complaining, um, yeah. the city code enforcement people might decide to say, you know what, you better not. Plus, who wants to be fighting with their neighbors, right? That's never any fun. Yeah. Well, nobody has complained yet. The roosters have been crowing for a week. Well, maybe you're okay. <laughs> maybe, but what do you think of rooster collar? The collar? What? Are you, what do you rooster, ask? a collar, you know, for... A collar? Yeah. That is not something I'm familiar with. That's oh, because it's in the, uh, on YouTube in order for the rooster to not crow too loud. Oh, I see. Yeah, they put the collar around. Yeah. I, I feel like that that doesn't sound very nice for the rooster. That sounds kind of difficult for them. Um, but I would maybe need to know a little more about it. But those kind of modifications are often kind of cruel for the animal. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, that's tricky. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You know the feed tricky. store. So if you have a feed store nearby where you got the chicks. If they have a bulletin board and you say, you know, I've got some roosters, mm -hmm. that's uh, sometimes a good source of people to take them because you find somebody with a big farm property and they don't care and they're happy mm -hmm. to have another rooster. Of course, they might oh. make them into soup, you know, in a couple of months. You don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. Uh, oh, we have such a nice uh, silky that is just so... Um, so <laughs> He's a handsome beautiful. dude. <laughs> they are beautiful. I mean, roosters tend to be the more flamboyantly colored and feathered version of any breed. The males tend to be, uh, you know, the fancier looking ones. And some of them are gorgeous. It's true. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll keep them until the neighbors <laughs> say something. Yes, you can see how you do. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Sure. All right. Well, Tyler, thank you. Um, we appreciate the time and all the uh, great answers and everybody on the call for all the great questions. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the chat questions. And uh, uh, as I said, you guys in the resource page that you'll be getting, there is a link to what's called backyardchickens.com. That place is amazing. That is a compendium of chicken information, resources, chat boards, uh, all kinds of sources of uh, wonderful knowledge. I told you about the breed section where you can compare breeds, but there's a, also a room, I mean, a section where people just ask all kinds of questions. The weirdest questions you can imagine, like, can I give drier lint to my chickens? You know, everything. And uh, there's also a Facebook group. So backyardchickens.com website maintains a backyardchickens.com Facebook group and they will have people ask questions on there and you get all kinds of answers too. So be careful once you start going down the chicken road, it's a slippery slope. You can get obsessed.